Good morning. It is Sunday, May 30th here at Brewster Friends Church, and we are um, excited today to finish our One Another series where we have journeyed together through the New Testament and looked at the, the, the One Another commands given to us throughout Scripture. And um, then to begin a new series starting in the summer. As we, uh, we think about looking back at this series, um, we began this series uh, because as I looked at the world around us, particularly following the election and, and all the, the things that have happened during the pandemic, I continue to lament that we have forgotten how to live with one another. That we've forgotten how to, to speak to one another, to disagree with one another, to be to one another what Christ has called us to be. The more I looked at the world, the more I looked at relationships, the less I saw of who we were supposed to be. I saw um, families in churches, in friendships just being ripped apart for reasons that that were not right that were not biblical that were not of Christ Christians being torn from Christians brothers and sisters in Christ being torn from one another for uh, for reasons that God would never commend and we've seen in this journey some vitally important ways that we are called to live with one another from loving one another and, and never hating one another to forgiving one another and encouraging one another uh, praying for one another, humbling ourselves to one another, bearing with one another and bearing one another's burdens, speaking truth and living peacefully with one another, showing hospitality, welcoming and accepting one another. For each of these, we examined how we live out those commands from Scripture in all of our relationships because, as we talked at the very onset, these verses are specifically written uh, almost all of them, about our relationships within the church. They're about how we live with, with one another as Christians. However, we're not called to be different people and have different relationships with people inside of the church as we are with people in our family or at our workplace. We're called to be like Christ to everyone. And so these ways that we're called to be like Christ within the church we should also see lived out, perhaps in different ways, but with the same motive and the same result uh, to people who are outside of the church. But here's the question that we're left with at the end of this journey. Why? Why should we follow these commands? Why should I be these things to all the one and others in my life? What's the purpose? What's the point? The point is not some religious litmus test for me to say, if you do all these things and you're a real Christian, It's not even to say these are the things that make us like Christ, although Christ modeled all these things for us. These things are meant to bring some good into the lives of the other person. Who you are to them is meant to change who they are and how they live. So we end with this one another command, the last one we're going to look at, from Hebrews chapter 10. And I believe that when we look at this command, it kind of explains the motive between, behind all the other commands. It's a separate one, but when we think about it and we look at it, it, it explains both why we do it and what the end result should be from how we live out these other things. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So I want to break down those verses and really look at what the author of Hebrews says to us in this one another command that calls us uh, to change one another's lives by how we live. He starts by saying, let us think. That word means to notice or observe or consider or contemplate. And it's not just think about. It means to think through from top to bottom, to deeply ponder something. Now, 
I believe if we were to appropriately, appropriately use that verb, we would normally be describing how we think about ourselves because we spend a lot of time considering how our problems, we think them through from every angle. We spend a lot of time thinking about our families, our careers, our finances, everything in our lives. But how often do you deeply ponder the problems in somebody else's life? How often do you think from top to bottom about the things going on in the lives of your friends or the people you go to church with or work with? The answer for most of us is not often. Because we've never spent enough time considering the one and others in our lives to even know the problems or obstacles or struggles they face. And it isn't even the negatives. We shouldn't just be thinking about one another when things are bad. How often do you consider the dreams of the people in your life? Do you know what the people in your family want to see in their lives? Or have you thought about how often you can help them get that? Or what your, your friends are dreaming about? Or the, your coworkers' career plans? You, you should know what the people in your lives are striving towards. Whether it's ending some bad habit, or whether it's meeting some, some life goal or dream. You can't fulfill the rest of this command, or any of the one another commands. If you aren't first thinking about the one another's in your lives, you should be pondering their lives. What you can do to help them solve problems, what you can do to encourage them to reach their dreams, it starts with thinking more of others and less of ourselves. Secondly, the author says, from let us think about ways to motivate one another. That word motivate you see sometimes translated stir up or encourage or provoke. It means to walk alongside somebody with the purpose of compelling that person to do something. We're not just walking beside one another to lend support, to just be there, to catch people when they fall or, or lift them after they've stumbled or mend them back together when they're broken. We're journeying together in this life with Christ, in, in, in just life in general, so that we can encourage one another to be something different. We journey together to motivate one another to make different choices. We journey together to speak truths of love and grace into one another's lives, even though w when those truths are hard. Your presence in each other's lives should make a difference. It should change people. It should challenge people. It should motivate people. It should motivate them to change when they're wrong, encourage them to change the things that make them miserable. It should prod them to reach for their dreams and make the most of their lives. We should particularly be concerned about one another's spiritual lives. In our walks with Christ, we need people who love us, people who see what needs change in our lives, who will support us through our struggles, who are willing to say the things that no one else wants to say and that, that we don't want to hear but need to hear. We need people to help push us in the right direction. And God is using us in one another's lives to move people closer to Him. Who you are in one another's lives should, should move them further away from the things that are wrong in their lives and closer to being who Christ is or closer to just coming to know Him. What are we motivating them towards? He, the, the author says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and of good works. Acts of love, that word is the word agape, the word it's used to describe the love of God, the word it's used to describe the very character of God. It is the highest of, of Christian virtues, the thing that we strive for. When we say love one another, this is the kind of love we're talking about. Good works means not just things that are morally good, but things that are beautiful. They're, they're holy. They're free from defect. They're things that we, we want to praise people about. This phrase reminds us of the opposite, that sometimes we can encourage or motivate people to do the wrong thing. He's, the author says motivate people, not just motivate them, but motivate them to good things, motivate them to loving things. The word that's used here can have a, a, for motivate can have a positive or negative connotation. We can motivate one another to make good changes. We can motivate one another to make better choices. Or we can speak in such a way that brings animosity or anger or brokenness. The words here are actually used in the book of Acts, and they describe uh, a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas about a young man named John Mark. And that disagreement leads to them 
basically ending their ministry together and their mission continues separately. Now, the this this word there means a sharp disagreement. It splits them apart rather than draws them together. It splits them apart rather than moves somebody closer to, to Christ. Now, for us to talk about who's right and who's wrong there is a whole other different Bible study. But there, there's no way that they both can be right there. I believe that that word is used there in the passage because somebody's wrong. There's a sharp divide there because somebody is motivating in the wrong way. They're encouraging in the wrong way. They're, somebody's made a wrong choice because of what's happened there. They, they are, have two completely different viewpoints. And what comes afterwards was not good. So that's a, a lesson to us, an example to us, to be careful that the ways that we're trying to motivate one another in, in our lives lead to something good. If the ways we motivate and encourage people tear them down, divide relationships, or cause us to view each other in a way that we no longer even want to be a part of one another's lives, that can't be the right way. It could be something wrong in us that doesn't want to hear the truths. It could be something we've said or done that's pushed people away. Be careful that what we do to motivate or encourage motivates or encourages good things things that are loving things that are of God things that bring people closer to him and not things that just push people away from us and him verse 25 then says do not neglect meeting together this is a verse that was quoted often in 2020 as churches were faced with this dilemma about shutting down during the pandemic what's important for us today is to see the connection between verse 24 and 25. To see that the purpose of gathering together as the body of Christ is to motivate and encourage one another. What that means is this. The purpose of us gathering together as Christians is never to fill ourselves up and get what we need. If you're coming to church, if you're watching this today because I'm empty and I need full, I need somebody to feed into me, that's wrong. It's, it's one of the reasons why I believe that that people stop coming to church because when it becomes all about ourselves, I don't need to be a part of a big group to, to feed me. I can feed me on my own. But the problem is when, when I live to feed me, I end up hungry all the time, empty all the time. The purpose of gathering together is not to hear a sermon. It's not even to worship God. Those things are good, and all those things should happen. You should be fed. You should get filled. You should hear the word of God. You should worship him. All those things are import important, and they are accomplished in us gathering together, but they should not be the focus of us gathering together. You see, the, the sermon, I'm not preaching for you to hear God's word. I'm not preaching for you for your knowledge to be puffed up. I'm not preaching for your heart to be filled. I'm preaching to encourage and motivate you. To do the things that, that God is saying here. I want to speak the words of God in a way that motivate you to change your lives. That encourage you to do things that are good, that are holy, that are kind, that are loving. The purpose of gathering together is to encourage one another. To encourage one another to acts of love. To encourage one another to acts of goodness. We are here not for ourselves. We are here for one another. We are here together not to stir up our own hearts, but to stir up the hearts of each other. It's why the notion that people have that they don't need to come to church to be a Christian is a complete misunderstanding of what church is supposed to be and of what being a Christian is all about. Now, people have that notion and that wrong notion because the people who are in church aren't there for the right reasons. They're there selfishly. Now, here's where you're right. If you're saying, I don't have to go to church, I can watch it on YouTube and, and, and be a Christian, you're 100% right. You don't have to be in a church building on a Sunday morning at 1030 or, or any building at any time of the day. Those things are not required to have a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. But to imagine that a genuine faith in Christ can be lived on your own is wrong. We need one another. God designed us to need one another. 
And we need one another to be the kind of person that Christ has created you and called you to be. You can't do that on your own. Jesus didn't call disciples to follow him and change and then say, now go do it by yourselves. No, there were always groups. There were always communities. They gathered together in different ways. Sure, how we gather together isn't what's important, but that we have one another is. Walking in and out of a church building on a Sunday morning is is no different than sitting at home and watching it on your computer screen. That's where people get this notion. Because it makes no difference in, in their lives if you're just consuming. If the church service is a source of entertainment, if it's to fill me up. See, when being a follower of Christ is about consuming, then you're not following Christ. If it's about what can I get, what can God give me, what can I get filled up with? What can I grab a hold of? Because living as a follower of Christ can never be about consuming. How, however, it will always be about being consumed. Your life is consumed by Christ. It is consumed by your desire to live and love for one another. We don't come into a church into a community however we come to it whether it's in a building through a computer that however we do it in a home doesn't matter what matters is are we are we where we are in the church for ourselves because it should never be about ourselves or to get what we need but to give what we've been called to give, to encourage as we've been called to encourage, to stir up hearts of people that they would be changed and become more like Christ. I was reading um, about this study, a guy named Peter Skillman, how to study. And he got two groups of people. He would get these groups of four made up of a particular group of people. And I'll describe the, uh, uh, what caused people to be put in these groups in a moment. But the task was simple. In these groups of people, he gave them 20 pieces of spaghetti, one yard of tape, one yard of, uh, of string, and a marshmallow. 20 pieces of spaghetti, yard of tape, yard of string, and a marshmallow. And said, build a structure. Make it as high as you can. The only rule is the marshmallow has to be on top. So the structure has to you know, be able to support the marshmallow, not marshmallow supporting everything else. Pretty simple task. Anybody can do it, right? But to do it well takes a, a specific group of people, apparently. Because group A, this group made up of a certain kind of people, they produce structures that averaged less than 10 inches. Then they make some taller than that, yes. But then on average, these groups of people, if, if they looked at the end of the day, the people of this kind their structures average less than 10 inches. Group B, their structures average 26 inches tall. Group A, this descriptor, couldn't average 10 inches, while group B averaged 26 inches. Group B was clearly the better group, right? They accomplished so much more with the same material. So 20 pieces of spaghetti, yard of a tape, yard of string, and a marshmallow. So, what was different about them? Well, Group A, the one that averaged less than 10 inches, was a group of elite university students, business students. And they were given the task and they sat down and they, they diagnosed it, they, they formulated a solution, they assigned roles, you do this, I'll do that. They worked on their own and clearly compared to Group B, they didn't do very well. And the reason they didn't do well was simply because they relied on individual skills. Because Group B, Group A, elite college students, best of the best. Group B. Group B were groups of four average kindergartners. Five and six-year-olds. Not like the gifted ones, not the best ones, just random five and six year old kids they built almost three times as high on average a structure as those elite business students 
it's hard to imagine that a kindergartner can produce something so much more effectively than these experienced, smart students. We see these unfisticated, inexperienced kids, but the difference was they didn't rely on individual skills. They didn't look at one another and say, I'm good at this, you're good at that. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. No, they interacted together. They worked together. They came up with ideas together. The kindergartners showed teamwork encouraged one another, motivated one another, and they accomplished more together because of it. While the business students, while working together, worked on their own. They were in the same place. They were trying to do the same thing, but they were trying to do it on their own. The kindergartners succeeded not because they were smarter, but because they worked in a smarter way. And the, the evaluators, the people running the study, showed that there was a simple and powerful method with groups working together where ordinary people can create something great, something that's greater than the sum of their parts. Friends, that's the church has already proved that. And I'm not talking about the church today. I'm talking about the church. When, when Christ built the church, he didn't find the smartest. He didn't find the brightest. He didn't find the best. He found fishermen tax collectors and sinners and, and Gentiles from outside the community and smart guys who used to criticize and persecute the community. And he brought them all together and melded them together in this group and said, now, together, I want you to go and take the message of who I am to the entire world. And the greatest powers of this world will stand against you. The strongest people will fight you. And they accomplished their goal because they worked together. Bound together by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, they worked together. They didn't rely on their individual abilities and intelligence or wealth. Now, when we presume that we have some degree of intelligence or, or ability or whatever we think it is that will allow us to believe that we can be better on our own or accomplish more on our own, we live life as if we are what matters. I'm what matters. And you will find out quickly that you will accomplish far less that way than we do together. That's why the church is not accomplishing the mission of Christ so prevalently today because we're all trying to do it on our own. We're trying to live this individual American life when we're called to live this community of Christ. Jesus tells us the opposite of rely on your intelligence and ability. Grab a hold of whatever you have and, and make the most of it. No, he says this, die to yourself. Give up what you think you can do. Give up what you think you're capable of. Give up your accomplishments, your pride, your abilities. Let all those go. Galatians 2.20 says, My old self, who I am on my own, what I've accomplished on my own, and all of its failures and all of its flaws, that has been crucified with Christ. It is dead. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God. Not trusting in myself. Trusting in the Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for me. I'm not what matters. We are what matters. He tells us, I know you're broken. I know you're imperfect. I know all your failures. I know all your flaws. And that's okay because you're this jagged, broken piece of a puzzle. That all your jaggedness and all your brokenness and all your flaws don't matter when I, you allow me to piece you together to make this beautiful image of God that we can show to the world. And when we're together in that way, the world doesn't see broken people who are imperfect because I'm not what matters. What matters is how we're together. And it's when we begin to live thinking about one another, thinking about how we can encourage and motivate and help one another make better choices better changes 
It's when we die to ourselves to come together as one. That we can actually begin to show Christ to the world. We won't do that on our own. We'll only do it together. At the end of the day, to be the kind of one another Christian that we're called to be, you can't be yourself anymore. You can't live for yourself anymore. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And when Christ lives in you, it's not just your life that's changed. When Christ lives in you, the lives of the people around you are changed. People see more of who they need to be. People make changes in their lives. Consider today how who you are and how you live is changing the people around you. How are you loving them in a way that changes them? How are you encouraging them in a way that changes them? How are you praying for them in a way that, that causes them to make better choices and be more Christ-like? All these one another's that we live out should be motivating each other to be more like Christ. That they see more of Him, not in who we are, but in who we are together as brothers and sisters. Let's pray today that we would no longer live but that Christ would live abundantly in us so that he can change the lives of people around us. Father God, we thank you that you look past our brokenness and our flaws and our failures and you see how we can be brought together with these people around us in a way that, that makes a beautiful picture. Not a beautiful picture of us, but of how broken, jagged people can be used to show the world the beauty and love of Jesus Christ. May we motivate one another, encourage one another to move away from the things in life that are breaking us and to move closer towards you. May how we live towards one another cause the one another's in our lives to see who you are and to make changes that bring them closer to you. Give us the patience to think about one another. To really ponder what problems we're going through. What dreams we're striving for. Give us the wisdom to motivate and encourage in the ways that, that lead not to wrong things. Not to brokenness. Not to negativity. Not to destroyed relationships. But lead to things that are good that look beautiful, the things that are loving and kind and compassionate. And may we never forget that we can only do that together. That we are not in this on our own. But to be the kind of one another that we are called to be, we need one another to do that. Bind us together today in a way that allows the world to see your beauty and your grace made from our brokenness. We pray that you do this work in us together as we all strive to live for, for you with one another. We pray all these things in your name. Amen and amen. Hope this has challenged you to begin to think about why we live with one another the way we're called to. And we challenge you to make the changes that you need to make to be the kind of one another that God has called you to be.